Hello everyone, um, happy Thursday to my normal little happy gang. Um, so the normal guys are all on by the look of it. Um, so you're all here, so Earl's here, Serge's here. Uh, where are we? Dick's here, Barry's here, Bruce is here, um, Daniel's here, Alan's here, uh, Marion's here, lots of you are here, Claudia's here. Um, so everyone's back online and ready to go. So welcome to Capture One version 22 preview. Um, just kidding. Uh, it's just in case David Grover's listening. Um, so we're not going to go do a version 22 preview. However, what we are going to do is start today um, talking about the fact that we are now using live Capture One version 21. As I said in the description, today's session is not going to be a review of Capture One 21, uh, nor is it going to be a run through of every single feature. If you want any of that stuff, we actually put up a video on, when was it, Tuesday? Um, with all of the details of what's in 21, um, how to use the tools, what the differences are in terms of when you're using Capture One um, and, and some of the workflow changes that have happened. That's all in there. Um, if you want to know more about version 21 of Capture One, by all means, head across to this same channel um, in the Pro Tips section. You'll see the version 21 Pro Tips um, video. It's about 20 minutes long, covers everything. So for the purposes of today, though, and most importantly, most of what we're going to show you is easily doable in version 20 as it is in version 21. Um, so we're going to cover a couple of bits of dehaze just out of interest, but um, we're also going to focus, we'll focus on the important stuff, which is editing your images um, with the tool that we've got, um, which actually, in my opinion, is the best tool out there to do it. Um, so let's get going. Um, we stopped at the end of last week's session with this shot, um, drone shot, um, big, big, big shipping container drone shot, uh, and we're going to start with the edit on this. Later on, we're in a couple of images time, just to give you a bit of a heads up, we're also going to cover the split levels um, question that comes up quite a lot about whether to use RGB channels or all um, channels when you're doing the auto levels thing, and we'll cover the reasons why um, sometimes it's not necessarily the best idea. In this case, we don't need to worry about levels too much. So this is a drone shot, um, shot presumably, let's just have a look from, uh, it's obviously going to be a DJI like most drone shots. Are. I'm not sure what camera it is on it. It may be the pro um, camera, so the Hasselblad camera, but um, effectively, we're not going to have a lens profile for that drone in Capture One. What you do have, however, is the manufacturer profile which has been embedded into the raw itself and that's what capture one's reading in so you could of course choose the generic profile if you want but you'll see that things have changed a little bit it's it's done a bit of uh, distortion correction if we load in the manufacturer profile that's got what the camera believes is the right profile um, but to me actually there is a little bit of barreling going on so we could, if we wanted to, undo some of that distortion correction. We see the difference of the chip of this ship in the front. The distortion correction stuff is a bit difficult. If you're doing architectural work, be really, really, really um, careful with, uh, with with not overdoing it, um, making sure that you're not um, allowing for barreling of, of any lines. If they're vertical lines, they should be vertical. If they're horizontal, they should be horizontal. In this case here, we've got lines going all over the place. Now, what I'm looking for is are the lines straight a little bit difficult to do when the when the boat is round but certainly when i use the full distortion on this this just feels like it's it's ballooned a little bit in the middle so i'm just going to back away slightly from what the manufacturer profile suggested okay so then we're going to do some analyzing of chromatic aberration just to try and clean the image up um, there's not much we can do in terms of diffraction correction on this shot. It's not going to have any impact. So let's move on to our main panel. And this is where we spend most of our time within Capture One. Just as a reminder, because it, it came up a couple of times um, with a couple of questions um, in terms of adding, funnily enough, with 21 with adding the dehaze tool. But adding and deleting tools in Capture One is really easy and moving the round is too as, as well. But it's a simple click. You right click anywhere in your panel here. And you can add whatever tools you want or are missing. So a lot of people that have got a custom workspace. So if you've saved your workspace in version 20, for example, you might find that when you come across the 21, the dehaze tool doesn't automatically appear. And it's because it's not in your custom workspace. Easy fix, right click, add tool, put it on there. The split between the tools that move down the bottom and the ones that are pinned at the top, that was introduced in version 20. Um, I can drag things. So I can put, if I want to, the new dehaze tool at the top of my sliding area or I can even move it up into the pinned area 
So now it doesn't move and it's always there. So I know some people choose, I mean, dehaze is probably not a good example, but some people choose to have white balance always at the top. I'm not sure why, but I've seen it quite often. You can move things between the pinned and the unpinned area pretty easily, and that's how we do it. So if, you, if you're missing a tool or you want to put a tool on a different tab, so say we want the color editor on our main tab, just right click, add tool, and then put whatever tools you want on there. Okay, um, so the actual image itself, just to put into context, we've got three of these images. One was shot at 6.3 seconds, one at 15 seconds, and one at 0 0.1 seconds. Now, what I'd say on these is what I'm looking for are, are two things um, in terms of which one we're going to choose. I'm going to choose the image which has the least noise. That's probably my primary goal when it comes to a shot that's taken at twilight um, and, and in this sort of level of light. But that can't be at the expense of it being sharp. So if this brighter image had a load of detail, which it does, but things were moving more than in the darker image, so let's say it's a longer exposure and we've got an issue where things are, are floating around, then maybe we'd stick with the darker image and try and correct for it. But if everything is sharp and everything is, is quite um, clean, then the best option is always to go for the one with the lowest amount of underexposed areas because we've got more data to play with. So if I look at this, this histogram here, I'm in a lot better shape than I am here because in here, if I choose to bring up some of these shadows, let's just do it in our high dynamic range area. So let's pull up that and our blacks. We can see we're also pulling up a lot of noise. Whereas in this shot here for the same perceived brightness, I don't have that noise level. So ideally, we want to effectively expose to protect our highlights, but get it as bright as possible to reduce the amount of noise that we're bringing in. As we bring up shadows, we tend to bring up noise. The less shadows we've got to start with, the less noisy we're going to, um, less noise we're going to have to recover. Right, overall feel of the image. So it looks really cool. The perspective looking on the the dockyard is pretty cool. Let's just put a quick guide up. So view guides, and then with my mouse I can just pull that across and just make sure our horizon is straight. Don't fall into the trap of trying to follow the line of buildings and mountains and stuff like that, because obviously they're above the horizon. If anything, actually, this is slightly tilted up at the left. So I'm just going to grab my straighten tool and just make a small change there just to level it up. OK. Uh, let's have a little look. So that's our guide gone. I could always turn it off. Um, with this image, we've got to think about what the focus of the image is. Now, it's probably going to be this ship. So let's try and draw the eye into it and maybe discount some of the rest of the stuff. First thing is I want to probably cool it down just a touch. Um, and we've talked about this on the on the Facebook group in terms of tint and Kelvin and so on and what's the correct color balance. Let's just try something. So let's do an auto white balance on the white of this ship. And it goes really cold. So why has it done that? Well, because that white on that ship isn't actually white in this light. And even if I click on this part of the ship here, well, this white that's out here on this ship is actually being affected by these lights here, which is slightly yellow. So this, although it should be gray or white, isn't neutral in this light. This isn't neutral in this light. Even if we move into, let's find, a, let's say this hanger, that's probably gray. That's probably a bit better, a bit more neutral. But each time we're trying to gauge what's real. And it's difficult when you've got light that's not pure daylight. So when the daylight is, is, is up and the, the sun is up, you're at roughly, let's say, between 5,000 and 5,500 Kelvin. That's daylight. And that daylight is what we refer to when we're talking about neutral whites and neutral white balance. The second we get into golden hour or blue hour or something like that, the neutral tones in your image are no longer neutral because they're picking up effectively the bounce back and, and beyond bounce back, even, even the overall ambience of the light that's around that scene. So using the auto picker is great in daytime. Outside of daytime, be really careful. You're probably going to have to do a little bit of it by eye. And that eye bit comes to, OK, does this feel right? And it's going to be based on what you remember at that time, uh, which is why actually it's a little bit more difficult for me to do when I wasn't there to, um, at the point that it was shot. Let's go with this. That's, that feels like a decent tone. Um, I am going to just um, add some extra texture into the sky and probably bring it down a bit. So we're going to create a new layer. That's habit. I don't have to do that. 
In Capture One, if I start drawing a gradient, it's going to automatically create a new layer for me unless I've created an adjustment layer first. Now, in this case, I want it to stop quite abruptly, but not to the point where it's noticeable. So I now have my mask on the top area here and not on the bottom. Press M to make the mask appear or disappear. Um, you've obviously got a grayscale mask as well that we can turn on if we want to. So with our mask, let's just make a couple of adjustments. So first one, I'm going to pull up a little bit of clarity. Let's just make that pop there. So let's just do a quick without and with. So clarity, again, we talk about it. it's a mid-tone adjustment tool. It's great for picking up um, differences in contrast between two areas. So it's a dynamic contrast tool. And what we get is these areas up here where they were pretty flat, let's say. So, you know, you've got a, a nice sort of calm pastel cloud and a calm pastel sky. By adding a pop of clarity, I would recommend using natural more often than any other. But by using a little pop of clarity, you can make that sky really, really come to life. Um, now, down here in the ship, we could probably use a bit of clarity in there as well, just to make it pop. But the first thing I want to do is kind of draw the attention into this ship and, and not up to the sky um, and not to these great big empty areas out here. So to do that, well, the one tool we're not going to use is actually the vignette tool, because the vignette tool has this effect of a lens vignette, which is effectively every single corner starts to darken down, dim down, and it looks like there's a, well, it's, it's what we used to try and get rid of with lenses, what we pay to not have with lenses. Instead of that, what I want is to draw the eye in without affecting other areas of the image. So we can do it with effectively a, a version of dodge and burn, but let's just, um, I'm going to call it darken layer. This one we're going to call sky. So double click on a layer, rename it what you want. It helps uh, when you want to come back to it later on. And I'm going to use our brush tool. Now, Capture 121, of course, we've got the new um, brush adjustment. So I can hold down Control and Option. And I can change my size. I can change the hardness of the brush um, without taking my eye off of the image. Um, and that works on a tablet as well as with mouse. Um, some people have reported some issues with older drivers and older tablets and so on. Um, get them into um, uh, Capture One, see if they can have a look at it for you. Um, but in general terms, it's working pretty well from what I can understand. Um, I will probably still take a long time um, to get used to doing it that way rather than doing it through the little dialog box, but I'm sure it'll come. So let's just draw a very rough mask. Now I'm using quite a light opacity. The reason that I'm doing it on an opacity is because I want to do this in layers effectively. So I'm layering up. And what I don't want is with flow, every time I go over the same spot again and again, it's going to get heavier and heavier and heavier. With opacity, as long as I keep the mouse held down, that one click everywhere I go gives me my 19% opacity. If I let go and now click again on that area, I'm going to get another 19. It's not quite as mathematically correct as that, but we'll get to a position where I can feather in the changes I'm making, in my view, a little more easily than what we do when we're using flow. So I'm actually just blending in some of these changes here. So it's not quite so uniform. Let's pull that back. OK, so if I look at my mask in grayscale, it's going to look pretty messy. Let's have a little. Uh, where did that go? How strange. We don't have a grayscale mask. Uh, display grayscale mask and it doesn't want to okay uh, we'll go with that's a point zero issue maybe I'm not sure what's going on there um, but what I've got effectively is a mask now with different layers and different amounts of layers all over the different parts of the the foreground and the image so let's then with that layer turn my mask off and we're going to just pull down our exposure a touch so again, be careful with exposure. So 1.0 on the scale, obviously, in, in photography terms, we're used to this in terms of stops. But, you know, one doesn't sound like a lot. That's half the light. We've halved the amount of light that was captured on these areas. If I now want to adjust that mask, because maybe I don't like the fact this has darkened quite so much, we can just go to our eraser key or eraser button or press E on the keyboard. You can link all your brushes. So the changes that I made on my normal brush will also affect the eraser. Um, but with that nice soft brush, I'm just going to erase some of this mask into here to keep that ship nice and bright. So all we've done so far, let's just do a quick before and after, is effectively we've toned down the image. 
So we've, we've cooled it down, we, we've settled down some of the, the greeny yellow um, tint to the image, and we've managed to take some of the focus away from these less relevant, less interesting parts and in towards the ship. We've also enhanced the sky. Beyond that, let's just make one final little change, which is a new layer, and I'm gonna call it Details. And with my brush, I'm gonna set the opacity to be a bit stronger this time and a bit smaller as a brush, so I've got more control. And I am just going to paint over very roughly. It doesn't really matter because we're going to make a subtle adjustment. The more subtle your adjustments, the less important the mask accuracy actually is. Um, it's only when you make these big swing adjustments that all of a sudden the edge of the mask becomes really, really obvious um, because you can see it a mile off with the adjustment. So with that done, let's just zoom in to this boat here. In fact, we're going to go in further than 100%. We're going to go into 200% to make sure we're not overdoing things. And with this, I'm going to pull down my highlights and pull down the whites. That's going to help recover some of these overblown areas around the lights. I'm then going to add some clarity in and a bit of structure for the edges, the texture, the lines, the detail. That's what structure is doing. So clarity, areas, structure, lines, details, textures, and noise. And this is the key thing. So imagine we'd used that original image, which had a load of noise in the shadows. If I try to pull up that structure, I'm also going to pull up some of the noise as well. OK, uh, let's have a little look at what that looks like as an overall picture. So with our details layer turned off, not that different. On, it's very subtle. But when I go in to our DR picture in detail and turn this off, you can see it starts to look a little bit blurrier effectively than with the details on. The key with this is don't overdo it. Remember, not only are we using only a certain amount of clarity, but also my mask isn't 100% either. So we're using a small amount of clarity on a 45% mask. And if that actually, even if that is too much, we can also bring down the opacity of that layer, of course, and decide how much we want. But the key with this stuff, genuinely, it is, I mean, it sounds trite, but it is less is more. Be really careful. Don't try and overdo this stuff because um, you end up with with stuff that is obviously overdone um, and, and be really careful. There's one final tweak I just want to make at the very top. Um, so I'm going to create a new um, layer and I'm going to call it darken top. So even though I've got the sky, I don't want to do this with the sky layer because the sky layer has 100% applied here, then a transition and then nothing here. I want to create a new layer which has a soft transition with 100% of the top up here and then eventually down to zero. And I'm even gonna move that off and soften it even more because with that layer, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull down our exposure a bit. That's a personal thing. I just prefer it when the scene doesn't get brighter as I get to the edge. I prefer it when it gets darker um, a little bit. That's drawn my eye to this area down the back here. So what I might do just for fun, um, oh, sorry. I just did something very silly then. Uh, which is I replaced our sky layer rather than doing it with the darken. So on our darken layer, I've just undid all of that. Let's now create that uh, that gradient. Move that up to here. Nice soft gradient and pull that exposure down just at the top. Again, not by too much. We don't want it to be obvious. What it has addressed though is, is that we've got a light area down here. So with that area, we're going to go to our brush tool and I'm gonna set a relatively big brush with a soft edge, 45% opacity is fine, and start drawing. Capture One's gonna come up with a warning saying, do you wanna rasterize the mask? What it's referring to is you have this gradient up here on the top. That gradient is doing a good job of darkening that top part of the image, but it's a gradient and it's still editable as a gradient. Now I want to add another part of the image that's gonna be darkened. I could do it on a separate layer. But in this case, I'm going to darken it by the same amount. So I'm going to say, right, rasterize. When I do that, I can no longer edit this gradient. This gradient is as if it's been painted on. But now on the same layer, I can paint on some extra bits. So let's just turn the mask off and I can darken those areas too. So all we've done is we've just calmed down that middle point in the image. And there we go. So quick drone shot um, from there to there. What's changed? Well, we've changed. We've increased some, some detail, some clarity. We've changed the punch effectively of that sky, how much that sky pops out. We've taken some of the focus away from the big empty areas in the corner. 
to my eye now it's actually looking a little bit on the green side but again that's personal preference but i'm just going to just warm or just uh, shade that up a bit more on tint there um, to me it feels a bit more neutral others may disagree um, that's that's personal preference you can work that out yourselves okay uh where are we uh is there a reason why do you never use refine mask um so honestly barry it, it depends um if i'm cutting out something very intricate around a um around the edge of a mountain top or something like that or a tree line with a sky behind it then yes we'd use the refine mask and we, we might want to try some some feathering around it just to make it a bit a bit uh neater but um i'm thinking back to the days when i used to use refine mask on auto masks and stuff like that because it was fixing a problem now i tend to use the luma range more to be honest in those situations where refine mask would help using a luma range and changing the radius and sensitivity on that can have a slightly better effect in some cases so to me the luma range has sort of taken over the need um, necessarily to to keep going with refine mask there are still some use cases don't get me wrong um, there are still some cases out there where refine mask is going to help but i'm finding that i'm using luma ranges more because in the scenarios where refine mask was useful um it's it's typically going to take over and do a better job um hugh saying uh, we should have also darken the water in the top side to match the water in the foreground if we mean up here i'm guessing hugh yeah um so again on that same darkened top layer I should probably not call it um darkened top <laughs> anymore um but we can add in to our mask um so let's just turn our mask off so we can see what's happening um and we can darken that down a little bit as well it's probably a bit too much so let's just change our opacity a bit up there that probably helps a little bit just to even it out yep um but again this then comes down to um to personal preference in terms of how you want that image to to see or to appear um for all this is the challenge for all i know the focus of this shot could have been that bright yellow crane out there and we've just made the <laughs> focus the big boat in the middle but um if that is the focus in the in the middle in that boat then this sort of works um and Prasad saying yeah refined mask using high contrast and sharp edges yeah it, it is um and and that's sort of my point with luma range because with it if i've got that high contrast um to bounce off of then a luma range is nine times out of ten going to do a more precise job than even the auto mask the the scenario where you used to have to find the three we well, still do find the three circles and, and get them um, aligned correctly for capture one to work out what you're trying to mask the luma range does it based on that contrast so if you've got a high level of contrast detail um and you've got a very very intricate foreground that you're trying to cut out i would try luma range before trying any complex mask and trying to refine it remember you can still refine a mask even with a with luma range attached to it as well okay so uh let's head to this shot so this was from francois and the question that francois had was about this roof so i think this is your edit francois and this is the original um and the question was about from memory it's been a long week sorry um we've got some blown out areas here um well not blown out but they're they're missing detail um so they've, they've sort of saturated maybe on the the blue side or something like that and here's our original um we, we have some highlights in there for sure um and it's how to get the best of it because if i look at this um this histogram here we've got some real bright highlights not so much in the shadows um can we try and calm it down and what francois has done already is used for the look of it levels down here to stretch that histogram to pull the shadows down there's also some other bits around you know bringing down highlights here and so on personally and this is where um it's it's a bit frustrated when i say this because um, there's a lot of work that's gone into this one um this is a perfect candidate for starting with a linear response curve so if i go to our color um section and we've got uh, our icc for d5 loaded in under our curve rather than auto which tends to spike it tends to give a little bit of a um, an s curve into the contrast if i choose linear response look at the difference i'm just going to zoom in actually so you can really see this so even though this isn't really overexposed as such you know it's not 255 255 all the way through if i switch to linear response look at all the detail that comes back in those those reflected areas it's almost like putting a polarizer on the shot and to me if we'd started from this position here 
with our linear response we're already starting pretty close to the final edit yes we've got some saturation boost that's been added down here yes there's more saturation for sure added in the sky but if i compare this to our original with the auto curve look at all the detail that linear response curve has already brought back in a lot of cases auto does a better job of of getting you to sort of 80 percent in the first place don't get me wrong i often use the auto curve but in a scenario where you're worried about peaking highlights or losing detail or flatness um sometimes just sometimes um using the linear response curve can get all that detail back to start with right so let's have a little bit of a play so starting from that linear response I'm kind of going to get to a similar point to where Francois got to. And if I look at some of the edits on here, um, they're actually pretty, pretty, or pretty standard. I think we're in a place where we're going to crop in a little bit. Um, so keep that same aspect ratio. Come up to here. By the look of it, there was either a little bit of a rotate. So let's just do a straightening tool. Let's try. I'm not sure if that is meant to be straight. I'm guessing it is. Let's give it a go yeah okay so we've got that there i can go to our healing brush so healing tool up here the one that looks like a band-aid make sure you've got it set to 100 percent opacity unless there's another reason for it and the same with flow you want a soft edge on it ideally and let's then just get rid of this branch it's chosen an area to take it from i'm going to just convince it that it should take it from over there instead um, and we've got our branch disappeared now Jeff has just said dehaze. <laughs> um, Claudio, I'll come to you in a second. Um, so dehaze. Yes, we could dehaze this shot. Uh, so let's load it up. So here's our dehaze tool. Can't do dehaze on a heel layer. Remember that. So when you see these blanked or blanked out, it's simply because you're on a layer that can't have an adjustment made to it. This is just a healing layer. So I'm going to create a new filled layer just so that we can change the opacity of it later on and call it dehaze. Now remember, and I'm going to say it again, just like I said in the previous YouTube sessions and so on, everything that the dehaze tool is doing can be achieved by you in curves and levels and, and clarity and combinations of all of those tools as well as HDR. You can dehaze an image arguably better than the dehaze slider can do with one click, but it will take you more time for sure. That's then down to personal choice. Using the dehaze tool here, it's gone and created an auto shadow tone. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's increase our dehaze. So let's go up to about 50. Okay, it's clearer. That shadow tone, it's been assessed based on Capture One looking at the image and saying, okay, which bits look flat? Where is all that stuff? Where does it sit in the red, green, and blue? And there's a bit of a hint up here as to what Capture One has seen. So if I look at our RGB channels, red, green, blue, our blue is all up here in that sort of upper highlights area. In other words, the place where haze tends to sit. So Capture One's auto shadow tone in this case has selected this color blue and said that's where the haze is. So what happens if I choose out here instead? And as I move my shadow tone around, so in other words, telling Capture One different elements of the image are what I consider to be haze, we get very different results. So the auto tone did something a little bit different to what I've just done. Let's just switch that back to auto. So it's made these very dark, um, a little bit unrealistic, possibly. Um, instead, by choosing maybe some of these, fine. We've, we've got rid of some of this stuff, but I now need to lift the image. The reason I need to lift the image is that haze was also brightening stuff. So as I remove the brightness of the haze, we also remove the brightness of the overall image. So. Let's use another tool to try and lift that up, which is actually in the HDR area. So we've got all this shadow tone down here, which is where these trees are sat. Let's pull up our shadows. Again, not too much, not that much, really. Um, just to there. That's a reasonable amount, and that, that works for me. Um, we could do a little bit of a color editor. So I'm going to create a new field adjustment layer. And with our color editor, I'm going to choose this sort of orangey color out here. Could do it with the mouse so we can up and we can right and left um, so you've got mouse options for changing hue saturation if you hold down the modifier key um, so the shift uh, is it the shift key who can't remember uh yeah no it's the alt key uh we can change the light so you can see how often i do it by mouse 
Instead, personally, I would always do it by the sliders, um, regardless of the fact that it's uh, maybe quicker with the mouse. So with those oranges, I can boost them a little bit of saturation. Don't do it too much. Um, I'm going to pull down the hue a little bit and I'm going to pull down the lightness a little bit. That gives us a bit more of a reddish glow to those areas. The sky, I mean, if I look at what Francois had before, it's, it's certainly been increased in terms of its blue. Um, we can do the same. So let's create an empty layer. And we're going to create a little uh, gradient on there. With our gradient, in this case, I'm going to make sure it goes over the tree line. And the reason is because we're going to add on a luma range. And that luma range is going to be removing all of the trees. So this goes back to the refined mask issue. So all of these trees out of the mask, I want to include everything up there. Maybe a softer tail off there. That works. A little bit of a softer radius and apply. I could move this down a little bit. And with that, I can use my color editor if I want. So I can darken down those cyans, increase the saturation a little bit. But it's probably going to be more useful to do it on the overall um, exposure of the shot. I'm actually going to split tone this, so cool down the sky pull down the highlights, pull down the whites. We could increase a little bit of clarity just to make this pop a little bit more and pull up a touch of saturation. I'm not sure I would go this far. Um, that just feels a little bit cartoony. Um, to me, this feels a bit more realistic um, than where we were before. So in, in quick terms, um, Francois, the, the quick answer to your, your initial question is how do I, how do I fix um, this issue down here? start with a linear response curve um, it gives you a flatter starting position and it means that you can still do all the other stuff we can still go into our levels so i can go into background i can pull up our highlights i can pull down our shadows a little bit so we can still get that pop if we want to we can you know we can brighten the the mid tones we can darken them by shifting the bias towards the other tones um, but all of that is possible from the linear d oh sorry the linear response curve but you're starting from a much flatter place when it comes to your highlights because it hasn't done that auto curve pop that added all that contrast in the first place. Uh, so if we go back to our before and after, so there's our before, there's our after. That's with a few little tools, little tweaks. And again, you saw not one of those tools was pushed to an extreme or the, the maximum extent. They're all small differences that when you do them together, add up to a big change. Um, we just don't want it so big a change that um, it's it's drastically different to what was there in the first place. Um, right, we're going to talk about RGB. I'm just going to have a quick sip of coke. I guess for some reason my uh, my throat is drying out today. So um, this is a shot from Ernst. Um, sent in. This is actually Ernst's edit here. Um, but I'm going to go back to this uh, version. I'm not sure if that's actually the original original no so there's our original there is a crop and there is Ernst's edit so with this shot what i can see and actually we had a similar case on the previous shot from francois but what i can see in our histogram is a difference between the red green and blue channel so obviously there will always be a difference in terms of where they peak and where they, they spike but in general terms what you'll find is most histograms tend to follow those three lines tend to follow roughly along the same lines as where um, each other is if i go to let's have a look at another shot here so we've got you know there's, there's quite a bit of blue up here that's obviously for the sky there's quite a bit of red down here it's generally found in the same batch of, of information um, but every now and then you get a shot with a and you can see it with your eyes it, it's got a definite swing to one particular color and some of that swing comes from the fact that we've got more of one color than another in a particular tone. So in this case, when it comes to the highlights, we've got more blue than anything else. We've got more bright blues than we do bright greens and bright reds. They're sat more in the mid tones and down in the shadows. So levels. When there's a reason why there are three different level options here as well as RGB. So when we use our standard RGB levels, what we're doing is we're taking effectively every value in all red, green, and blue, and we are stretching them all together. So in proportion to where, it, where they all sit, but we're stretching the entire histogram along. So as I move this along to the right, we can see the blue races up there, the red and the green follow afterwards relative to where they were to start with. 
as I do this on the bottom left, the red and the green race towards the shadows and the blue is following up afterwards. So what we've done is we've stretched the entire histogram, changed its uh, the properties of the tones of the image in one go. So all relative to each other. Now, if I undo that, and use the auto levels function, which is the wizard, the little um, the little magic wand. Let's click on the wizard. <clears throat> so what has that done? Well, auto levels is really, really simple, actually. It looks for where the data really starts. So if you've got this sort of underlying flat line bits of information, it's going to kind of skip over those a little bit and look for where there's meaningful data in the histogram. So let's undo it. If we were doing this manually, then we'd probably do the same. So what we'd say is, well, here's where the data really starts that first bit of blue and here's where the data really ends the first or that bottom bit of red and we'll drag that one up there to where the data starts on the red and we'll drag this one up here to where the data starts in the blue and strangely enough our manual method gave us a very similar result to the auto method because that's what auto is doing now if we switch our method of doing auto levels in here under exposure you can change your channel mode to instead of rgb channel change it to red green and blue channels it may not make it that obvious to start with but what that's talking about is separating the channels so now if i do auto levels watch what happens it changes completely the entire image now randomly via an ambulance <laughs> um the i'm not sure whether you heard that the entire image tone has changed. The colors have changed. So why? Because it's still auto, right? Well, think about what it's done. In our red channel, it is now auto leveled to where the red was. So the red started out up here, lower down the blue. So it stretched the red even more. It's dragged the red to include highlights now. And the red was lower down in the shadows. So it hasn't done so much of a move there. Let's look at what it's done to the blue. So the blue, well, it started already up pretty high, so it didn't have to drag those blues as much to get them up into the very, very peaks of the highlights. But it did have to drag the shadows of the blues down all the way to the left. And likewise, green pretty much followed red. But we can see these level adjustments, uh, highlights, 162 on blue, 148 on green, 150 on red. When we do it as a combined change in the RGB levels tool, it's pulling them up proportionately to each other. When we do it as individual channels, and whether that's done through the auto levels function there, or whether it's done by doing, in fact, we don't even need to do the auto levels. Let's just turn that off. Uh, let's go back to RGB, and I'm just going to reset that. So our auto levels gives us that blue tone. Let's reset that. I can do an individual channel based levels adjustment. I can do that with our reds. I can go to my greens and pull to where the data is. And then I can go to my blues and pull to where that data is. And we get, it's not quite the same, but you get the idea. By pulling those channels independently, we're controlling how much we're shifting the blue channel, how much we're shifting the green channel, how much we're shifting the red channel independently of each other. So it's not looking at the overall histogram and stretching it. It's looking at each channel as its own histogram in its own right and stretching them independently. And this is why sometimes, so the, the default position that a lot of people get to is a position where they start thinking we've got to have it separated out in RGB terms because it's better. It's not necessarily better depending on your image. So depending on where you are with that histogram to start with, you might find that by separating out the channels, you get a result that you don't want. So be really careful with the sort of blanket statement of separating out the channels is the best way to do it in this channel mode. To a lot of images, leaving it as RGB will give you the, a better result sometimes. Certainly most of the time the same result, but more importantly, there's nothing stopping you making your own little tweaks separately on top of the overall RGB. So that's probably a bit complex um, for, for a uh, Thursday afternoon. Um, but that's when we're referring to the RGB versus auto levels um, tool. That's what we're talking about. Capture One allows you to independently do levels changes on each of the red, green and blue channels. But only if you want to. And, and the auto function is only if you enable it. If you don't, 
you're going to find that actually this standard RGB levels function works perfectly well for most scenarios. Okay, um, let's have a look at curves because Claudio is getting very impatient. Claudio, don't worry, we'll get to it. Um, so let's um, let's look at curves versus uh, Luma versus RGB. So keep the same hat on that you've just had with the levels tool. So levels is adjusting those those peaks and and um, shadows um, independently if you choose to do it by by um, readouts by um, channel RGB red green and blue. The same can be said for curve. So what curve is doing is it's going to adjust those levels, the RGB levels, based on where they sit in this line. So let's just do a very, very easy S curve. And let's look at what's happened because it's translating. So it's translating each of the red, green and blue channels as an interpretation relative to this diagonal line. So in other words, this blue bit here on this left hand side, because I've raised up from the midpoint, what it's going to say is if you are a blue here, we're going to we're going to increase your value. We're going to increase your luminosity and that's going to pick up on that blue. But notice it's not going to pick up on this green because this green part here, this peak of green information, we haven't touched that line just intersects the standard diagonal. So it's not making any change down here. Well, we're going to pull down this blue here. But we're not really going to affect too much of all of this um, mass of red down the bottom left hand side so editing the curve on the rgb tab will have a color shift if i do it on the luma tab which is different let's do that same curve so the same s curve it is ignoring the color channels and it's changing the brightness values effectively luminosity value so Rather than worrying about, well, I've got, I'm going to pull up some blue here and not some red and pull down some green here and not some, some blue. In this case, imagine this curve as brightness. So here are our shadows, so our, our blacks here, shadows here, lower midtones, upper midtones, highlights in the top right, and then whites in the very, very, very top right. It is going to pull those up independently of their color. It's just going to change the luminosity value of each of those pixels rather than changing the makeup of the pixel based on how much blue, red and green was in there. Now, if I do so, that's with our Luma curve. Let's uh, in fact, let me just clone it so you can see as a comparison. I'm going to pretty much copy this curve rough. It's not going to be quite the same, but let's go to our RGB and on this one, let's just reset our Luma and do the roughly the same curve in RGB. And let's look at the difference. So we've got our RGB curve changed on the top and our Luma curve changed on the bottom. And let's think about what it's done. So our RGB curve, we've pulled up the midtone or the upper midtones and we've pulled down the lower midtones. So we increase the highlights, decrease the shadows. Where did our blues sit? They sat in those upper midtones, the highlights. So we've increased all the blue. And where did the reds and the greens sit? Well, they sat down in the lower shadows. So we've decreased them, we've lowered their values. When it comes to doing it by Luma, it's not worrying about red, green, blue and what it's doing to those values. It's literally pulling up the luminosity of that scale. So if you were a upper midtone, we're now going to raise your brightness effectively, regardless of your color, just, just literally raise the brightness. Don't pick on one individual channel, just pull it all up the same in the lower midtones. So in broad terms, if you want to affect um, the content of your image, while including some changes to color and more importantly saturation because one of the things that happens with an s curve is you increase contrast but you also tend to increase the saturation of the colors you're affecting then use your rgb curve if you only want to affect the values of brightness which can actually have a desaturating effect if we if we do it in this sense you use the luma curve because it's not going to have that skew that's based on where the color data sits I think that's it. Does that answer your question, Claudia? We'll, we'll have a little um, consensus in a minute. Um, so, uh, Brad, uh, you just said, is there a good example of why we would want to adjust the channels individually? Um, yes, there there is. So, uh, funnily enough, for example, if we want to get rid of one particular type of haze. <laughs> so, if our haze, in this case, let's go back to this image here. Um, if our haze was sat in the blue area here, then of course in my blue channel, I could just knock that back. 
and get rid of the blue tint. So I could move that midpoint along. I could actually move this point along as well and shift it. Now, of course, the problem with that is once you get rid of the blue, then the other colors start taking over and you could end up in a little bit of a of a, um, a mix up if you uh, if you start getting it a little bit wrong. But in broad terms, there are scenarios where you might want to affect one channel more than the other. You might want the reds to become brighter, um, especially you know, on cities at night, sometimes we'll try and um, increase the, the fluorescence effectively of the blue lights um, on, a, on a road or something like that. Um, so you can use that just that channel tweak on just that color. Of course, you don't have to do it in levels. We could do it through our color editor. If we want to get rid of the blue tint on this, well, what we could do is just go to our blue color editor and pull down some saturation. It's going to do a similar thing. So don't forget as well within um, Capture One, you've got several different ways of, of attacking the same problem. So sometimes you'd use the color editor, sometimes a curve, sometimes levels, sometimes now the dehaze tool and choose a shadow tone. Um, but there we go. Um, right, Claudio is <laughs> Claudio is happy. Yes. Um, so we have crystal clear explanations. But in broad terms, um, again, so actually going back to, to John's made the point correctly. So luma if you want to adjust those brightness values curves will help you also pull saturation with it but if you feel that's going to be a bit out of control just like john said so you can do that with the color tools so sometimes you're going to get a bit more refinement if you use a luma curve and then use the color editor to make some of the color changes you want to do the reason being that obviously in this curve i can't control where that blue really sits um, that's the data that was captured so if I want to increase some mid -tone or some upper mid-tones here, I'm going to be pulling the blues with me. If I do it through Luma and then use a color editor, then I've got a bit more control, a bit more, uh, a bit more refinement. So there we go. Um, now, actually, so sorry about um, that, Ernst. We've used your image <laughs> as a bit of an example. What I was going to say on your image, genuinely, I actually quite like the edit that you did. Um, it's a little bit on the blue tint to me. Um, what I'd be tempted to do with it is actually try the new dehaze tool, pick on this um, blue shadow tone and just knock some of it back. We might actually want to choose out here. Uh, there we go there. And then what I'd be tempted to do um, is just pull back some of that hue on the blue just to cool it down um, a little bit. That's that's the only tweak I'd make with it. But the feel is meant to be frosty. It's meant to be layered and whatever. I don't want to remove the haze from it. The haze is what makes, you know, the fog is what makes the shot. Um, so I would, um, I wouldn't go far from there. If you start playing with auto levels and auto curves and, uh, and different Luma curves and so on, you're going to get some very different results. Um, but it's a, it's a nice shot. Um, you know, your choice in terms of the color feel for it. Who knows? Um, maybe I prefer the bottom one. Maybe I prefer the top. Uh, it probably depends on the day. Okay. Um, oh, sent this shot in. Uh, that was the crop that you made, I think. And this was the original. Um, so at F8, I might um, put some diffraction correction in just, just quickly. And let's go across to our exposure tab. Now, I see what you've, you've done um, with this. I think I'm in a place where I want some more foreground, if I'm honest. Um, it looks great, um, the cloud. The cloud is, is stunning, but I, I need a bit more context. And, and it's a shame because this water here and, and these houses sort of add that. Um, it's, it's got a bit of a bit of a feel that um, shows context and place and where it is and, and so on. So what if instead of that, we actually kept the full width of the image and we went for a one by two crop instead. So we could come out to maybe here. In fact, we can go in a little bit tighter there. Might have to do a bit of healing, but we'll have a look at that in a second. And so to me already, you know, this is a nice picture of a cloud. This is a picture of a scene. Um, and I, I think I'm in a place where I'd rather see the whole scene um, than just the cloud itself. Now, these annoying little reeds, um, Let's just see what we can do this quickly with our healing brush. So again, we choose the healing brush, so the top one, um, a nice little soft brush. And let's just draw over our reeds. So I thought this might be tricky. 
Um, so the problem is going to be that Capture One is going to try and be really clever in where it takes some of these um, bits of content from and effectively try and blend them but I'm not always going to agree with how it blends which is a little bit annoying. I'm going to be honest here this is probably one that I would take out to a pixel editor um, to get these simply because the textures behind I mean even if I start choosing different areas um, I'd have to create so many different healing layers. It's going to do a reasonable job, but it's not going to get it right. We could go into our clone tool. Um, so if we, instead of using our healing brush, we use our clone mask. And let's choose a source here and paint up there. Yes, yeah, it's, it's going to make a, a slightly easier job of it, but it's certainly not perfect. Um, so I'm going to say, for the purposes of this edit, we're going to leave the reads where they are on the basis that I'd probably use a different tool to get rid of them a lot more um, accurately than what we can do with, with the raw brushes. However, the scene overall, let's have a little look at what we can do. I'm going to first of all add a new layer, and we're going to call it Sky. Same as what we did before, funnily enough. Um, with our gradient, we're going to just draw a really soft gradient down here. Um, so that's going to have a nice soft fall off and with that we're going to push up some clarity great keep it natural don't be tempted to go for punch because that's going to add in some extra boosts of color and stuff um, it doesn't make sense that you've got all this rich color in the sky if the bottom part of the image is looking quite flat um, yes we want to use it to make the image pop and be vibrant but don't get it to the point where it's unrealistic and couldn't have possibly happened now down here in our in our foreground well let's add a new layer and in that foreground we're going to go up there and again so let's see our mask okay i'm just going to move that a bit further along choose a luma range and in this case i want all of the dark stuff and i want to exclude that sky there now we're going to protect this in two ways so the first is i've now excluded most of the sky the second way is i'm only going to be pulling up shadows and black so there aren't any shadows or black up in this top part of the sky so it's not going to really affect it but by using a luma range we've made double sure that we're only affecting these dark parts of the foreground with that bottom part i'm actually tempted to split tone this and what i mean by that is i'm actually going to warm up the base of our shot here just to there and with our sky i might even choose to cool it a little bit and just add a bit of a tint in there Okay, so let's just see where we got to before and after. So there's our before, there's our after. That's looking a bit more, um, a bit more clear, certainly in terms of that foreground. Now we're pretty sharp on this shot. It's nicely, um, nicely stable and detailed. Along here in this particular part of the cloud, so I don't want to overdo clarity on the whole thing. But what I am going to do is call a layer orange class cloud. Yeah, tongue tied. Okay, and choose our brush. With our brush, I'm going to go for a really soft brush edge, um, quite a low opacity, and we're just going to start adding in some brush strokes. And all I'm doing is adding extra layers of brushing over the bits I want to affect the most. So I'm not going to really affect up here. I am going to affect here a little bit, but nowhere near as much as we are down here. If I look at this, let's see if we can get that grayscale mask going on again. Nope. Okay. Doesn't want to play. Not sure why. We'll have a chat about that later. Okay. With our mask here, um, if I look at our sky, remember we changed that um, white balance amount, 5882 and 3.4. So up here, I'm going to go the same. So we haven't got any deviation between what I've brushed and what is um, on the layer below. And with that brushing, I'm then going to use my clarity to pull this up even more in these areas here. And I might even be tempted to pull a little punch of saturation in. Again, not too much. Don't overdo it. So there's without, there's with. It's enough to make it stand out, but it's not so much that it's overdone. So to me, that's sort of it. That would be where I'd leave it, to be honest. Um, so we go from there to there. Uh, if I create a new, so the original file was here. I think that crop feels a bit better. It feels more um, print-like. Um, 
this shot here oh to be honest i, I love the cloud i think uh, yeah you just, you just said the sky was so awesome i agree um it's a really amazing sky you know rainbow rain storm cloud sunset it's everything in one one combination i just think to me it's the context of where it is that helps um a little bit um but nothing wrong with this edit either um it's it's a good edit of, of the cloud itself um but again caveat we'd need to take this part down here this read into a separate pixel editor just to get rid of it because it's uh it's just a little bit annoyingly in the way okay um so uh, john's just saying so you've had the similar problem so okay let's have a look no very strange maybe it's a oh, and then it appears and then it doesn't appear so maybe it is a maybe it's a graphics card issue although i'd be very surprised but and now it's instant very strange okay that's what something we're gonna have to keep an eye on um always fun using 0, 0.0 versions of software but there we go so that's our shots um so far for today so we have run through a bit about rgb um splitting out the the channels in levels as well as in curves um, and what that does um the use of linear response curve to get back some of those overblown highlights or, or higher contrast points um, from a drone so how do we focus on um, this area down here and also bring back all those details and, and highlights um, using some of the recovery tools and then this one just a really really nice um, scene really nice cloud um, and just how to enrich it one final thing i think it was raimondo's um, was asking about um uh focal length um and diffraction and all this other stuff so how to get everything clear and i think you've done a bit of experimenting um in this so this is a f32 this is a f22 this is a f16 this is a f11 this is a f8 and so on all the way down to see what is in focus so general rule um for getting stuff in focus at f22 you are going to have a huge amount of the scene in focus but you are also going to have some issues with sharpness that is what the diffraction correction is for so diffraction correction will try and sharpen up images which are heavily diffracted and you're going to find that at images above about f8 so in other words a smaller aperture than f8 so f11 f16 and so on that's where we start to see diffraction creep in but you get everything in focus if you want a sharp image then typically a lens that's shooting at somewhere around f8 is going to be at its sharpest but you're going to have an awful lot less in focus so in this case we've got probably this span here in focus but not the foreground and not the background so that's the quandary if you want to get everything in focus but also completely sharp and that's what focus stacking is for so what focus stacking allows us to do is to take the sharpest possible image especially when we're up close again and again and again and again at different focal lengths sorry different focus points and blend them together automatically using something like helicon if you want or you can do it manually in photoshop or affinity with um with brushing but that allows you to join all those images together into one sharp completely in focus shot otherwise absolutely Raimondo you are on a you're on a trade-off between I've got everything in focus but it's a little soft at f22 or f32 if you can do it down to f11 is a, probably a decent compromise f16 and f11 are landscape compromises let's call it that they allow lots of stuff in focus but are still relatively sharp the sharpest is probably going to be around f8 for a lot of lenses sometimes 5.6 but you're then um, giving up some of that depth of field the depth of field is gotten around and gotten over by using focus stacking um, and something like helicon to do that okay um that's probably it for today um a couple of things so number one um, make sure you have a look at the version 21 guide this afternoon in about an hour at five o'clock um uk time so six o'clock europe time i don't know what time that is in all the different places in america but you know 12 o'clock through to 9 a.m i guess um and the reverse a bit later over in asia um david grover is presenting on the capture one pro channel on youtube and on facebook for that matter um the official intro into version 21 what we have is my version of how to use those tools but if you want the official guide and the the view on how those tools were intended to be used um how to get the best out of them and so on then tune into that at five o'clock today so it's about an hour well one hour's time um and i'm sure that'll be quite an interactive session um 
so do check that out you'll get the um, the official view of um, the tool set um, in the meantime we obviously have fun time facebook group um, so for any of the questions that we didn't get to today bung them into there happy to discuss the version 21 stuff as you've seen we found a couple of niggles in 21 already in this session today um, i'm sure others will come and i'm sure they'll be fixed at, at different points um, as new features and, and updates come out um, in the meantime of course you've got all of that library of the youtube um, content for how to do before and after clarity structure etc etc don't forget someone asked earlier how to upload um, images so that's how um, go to poryforlive.wetransfer.com send your images in um, we will get to as many as we can um, within each session and in the meantime we will catch you in a week's time so next thursday three o'clock uk time wherever that is in your time zone um, stay safe um, be nice to david at five o'clock um, he's been working very hard on something that was actually a very good piece of software um, so let's hope that uh, that session goes well but do tune in to see what's um, see what's said and we'll catch you in a week cheers everyone bye bye